Hi there, folks. Sorry about that. My internet has decided to die exactly at 8 a.m., which is super fun. Uh, okay, so I'm doing this on a data plan. Hopefully this uh, won't cut out at any point. Um, yeah, just maybe let me know if there are any technical issues during either. Um, just let me know in chat or just feel free to shout out. Uh, right, so let's jump right into things. Uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, cool, so just some quick announcements, right? So the uh, pre classes just sort of going on as usual, just laid out in order pretty much for the rest of the semester. So you can just um, work through those. They're all sort of available on uh, Gradescope right now. Um, so if you want to try to work ahead a little bit on any of them, if you have extra time, um, then you can do that and just kind of clear as many out as, as, you're, as you're able to. Um, the rest of the semester is really just everything we're doing now, all of this uh, trigonometry. Um, I think the last section is 5.2 or 5.1 or 5.2. Um, and I think a lot of that is simplifying trig functions. Um, so really, I think you're probably equipped at this point um, to do all of these kinds of problems. Um, it's just a matter of um, practicing some specifics. Sorry, I just realized my volume is super low. One sec. Right, so pre-classes, yep, just have a number of them left. Um, let's see, in terms of the project, I think I kind of sent out sort of a status um, summarizing where you should be. I think what we want to do is go ahead and have some kind of rough draft due, I think I said at the end of this week, so maybe Friday. Let me just pull up the announcement so I can double check um, the exact dates. Um, but just as a rough idea of where you should be um, at this point, hopefully you've met with your partner and at least kind of discussed your understanding of the project and sorted out if there are any like parts that you don't understand. This would be the week to get any questions that you have answered. So I'll be in office hours later today um, and I'll try to hold some extra office hours throughout the week. Um, and this would be the best time to, you know, just clarify things. Hopefully you've read the project, project handout. Um, and yeah, just, just see kind of if there's anything outstanding that you don't understand about the project at this point, or sort of what's, re what's required or what needs to go into it. So we'll talk about it today, you know, more in more detail and Thursday. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you've already met. If you haven't met, then uh, at this point, you probably are a little bit behind, so please do try to like meet with your partner ASAP, um, right? Just to avoid missing kind of easy, easy points on the project. If you're if you end up behind on these kind of things, then it's hard to absorb like the finer points we get into in these later. Um, you know, as we get closer to the due date, the things that we discuss are kind of uh, yeah, they're, they're meant to be more fine points on on things you've already uh, hopefully looked at. Um, probably want to discuss the structure with your partner a little bit. Just going back to the announcement on ELC here. Um, just like how many how many overall sections do you think you want? You know things like there's, you know, you, you definitely have to have like an intro section, some kind of middle piece, and some kind of conclusion. Um, so there should be some kind of like macro structure to your document that you've sorted out so far. But you might want to want to also decide like in that introduction. Um, do you want to combine this like uh, explanation of the physical situation uh, and just make it one sort of introduction that covers everything? Do you want to break it down into two pieces? Some people have done this for uh, previous projects where you know one of them is an introduction discussing kind of what the goals are and what the mathematics you'll be doing will be. And then there's a separate section for like the actual physical situation. Um, you want to discuss a little bit how you want to break up this middle analysis 
Um, so we're discussing some stuff in class. So there's some stuff from last class, some stuff from today, and some stuff from Thursday. And these will definitely need to be in the project in some form or another. Um, and just a quick like disclaimer, the if you're doing the derivations for um, stuff that you have to include in the project, you really do have to walk through these steps yourself. So that's really not, not super great to, you know, if we just like go through something in class, we just get to the final answer. Like in your project, you don't want to just like start with the initial thing and then say, okay, and here's the answer. Like last time we did some like derivation of solving for M and, and this kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people for project two just said, okay, here are the initial equations. Here's what happens when you solve for M. Um, but this being a math class, that's kind of the part that you really need to show. Or like that's, you know, that's one of the more important parts. The analysis is, is important, but being able to walk through these derivations yourself um, is also really key. Um, but yeah, so discuss with your partner how you know, how much of that analysis you guys understand and make sure to try and get to office hours if you don't discuss how you want to break up this uh, intermediate um, analysis section. So in our case, you know, we at least have two things to look at. We have like one situation is where this leaf is stationary and one situation where the leaf is rotating throughout the day. So maybe you want to do one now anal one analysis of both together. Maybe you want to break this into two subsections. Maybe you want to do one and your partner do does the other. That kind of thing. Um, definitely have have these discussions. Um, so ideally, that's where you'd want to be at by today, having met with your partner, having discussed the structure, and having discussed your understanding of this analysis in the middle, just based on what you've read in the handout, which hopefully you've read at this point. Um, by Thursday, I would aim to have some kind of rough draft completed based on just what we discussed today. We'll go through a lot of the um, analysis you need for the stationary leaf case. Um, but there are some decisions you as a group have to make. And we talked a little bit about this. There's going to be um, coming up with some kind of angle function, some sort of periodic um, trigonometric function that models um, this like energy density throughout the day. I'll say a little bit more about that when we're talking about these details. Um, but there, there's some choice here that, that you have to make, and it's kind of a, a difficult choice, I think. Like, to, you have to now turn all of the math that we've been doing on its head, and you have to, like, yourself come up with a function to model this thing. Um, and I think that's that's a little bit tough. So, um, yeah, by Thursday, you want to um, have some of this analysis for the stationary leaf, um, at least copied down, written out, and make sure you understand it, and then make sure you get to office hours um, if you need help with the derivation. Um, and then I would also aim to like have, you know, just things like the abstract and introduction. I think I, I usually recommend writing these last because you kind of don't know how much you need to introduce or what the summary is until you've already done all of the work. But I think in this case, um, uh, it's it's maybe easier to have an abstract or a, an intro or both to have a rough draft for them um, because I think they're pretty easy to write in this case, um, just describing the situation overall. There's not really too much um, to say about those. It's not as complicated as Project 2 or Project 1 um, in terms of the, the physical situation. Um, but yeah, maybe just have a rough draft of those, and then after you're done with the project, come back and do a, a final final draft of the intro and abstract sections. Um, and then, yeah, by Friday, go ahead and turn in something on grade scope. Should just be some version of your project, which hopefully includes abstract introduction um, in this analysis of the stationary leaf, and then some indication that you've started looking at the rotating leaf, which is what we'll be talking about on Thursday. And I think that's pretty much it. And then we'll try to go ahead and have the final draft due next week. Um, so that way you can have an actual sort of uh, fall break of some sorts anyways. All right, so that being said, um, I think that's pretty much it for announcements. Um, and I'll say stuff about office hours a little bit later too. 
Okay, so. Um, Professor about. Garza. Oh, yeah. Um, I saw in grade scope that there was like a pre class and like worksheet due like Thursday of next week. And I was wondering if that's still, if we still have those assignments due. All right, because we have, I think, is it like holiday break starts Wednesday, I think? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. yeah, I'll probably go ahead and move those, uh, move those back then. Okay, thank you. Do you know which um, which assignment it was offhand? Um, no, but I'll look it up right now. Okay. Yeah, if you want to just drop it in chat or something, that's that's totally fine. Yeah, so whatever the pre-class and whatever the worksheet was for that, I'll probably just um, push it back to the next week. Um, it was the 4.5B worksheet. 4.5B. Yeah, it was like the pre-class and I think the worksheet too. Cool, cool. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to just push everything back. Um, make that do the following Tuesday-ish. Okay. Um, and so we see what we are looking at today. So I think today is probably one of the more the more fun days. We just get to look at a lot of a lot of uh, demonstrations, which is which is nice. Um, I just want to remind uh, set out some reminders of things that are kind of important at this point. Um, so maybe want to review. So things that are coming up on pre classes. Uh, are these special angles? And I just remember that there were a few, maybe like a handful of these that we, we want to know. Maybe it's actually better to, to say special like reference angles. It's kind of the best way to think about them. So these are all of these angles in the first quadrant. Um, I won't list them out, I'll just say in words. You can kind of go back and look at the notes um, from a previous lecture if you want to see the discussion of them. Um, but the point was is that there are these huge complicated diagrams on Google where they list out like every single special angle on the circle. And there's something like three, six, nine, plus four, 13 of them. Um, and the important point there is do not memorize that circle. I think that's something that's um, pushed in a lot of um, like trigonometry or other pre-calculus classes. But the idea here was that we had this, this sort of flipping process um, where you kind of pick any angle you want, you find this reference angle, and this reference angle is going to tell you what triangle to look at in the first quadrant to sort of determine sine and cosine and all of that. Um, and then you can just kind of flip things around, change the x and y coordinates between plus and minus to get the right thing. And so you only really need to memorize, I think it was six angles. You can go back and look at the table, but it's essentially in the first quadrant, you know, something that's like zero radians. And uh, then you go pi six, pi fourths, pi thirds, and so I guess that's only five. So zero, pi six, pi fourths, pi thirds, and pi halves. And these are like, I have to emphasize that we really do want to memorize what the values are for these or have a way of like easily remembering how to come up with them. And just remember we had this table trick where you could kind of list out sine and cosine and kind of do like square root of one over four, square root of two over four, kind of work your way up for the uh, the sine values and work your way down for the cosine values. How do you remember which one is up or down? We have this, um, you know, this mnemonic that Sign values should kind of look like y coordinates. Cosine values should look like x coordinates. It's not exactly true unless you're on the unit circle. It's not that cosine of theta, sine of theta is the xy coordinate. You have to take into account the radius for this like polar transformation. Um, but loosely, this is kind of how you want to think about these things. And then so when you're trying to remember these angles, you can just remember that if you're at, 
you know, zero degrees or something, the sign is starting out at zero, it's the y-coordinate. And as you're, you're kind of going through this quarter rotation up to uh, pi halves, radians, the y-coordinate is increasing. So the sine is the one you want to increase when you're doing this table process. And the cosine is the x-coordinate, so the cosine is the one that's decreasing. Okay. Um, so yeah, just remembering the special angles, remembering this mnemonic about sines and cosines corresponding to y and x-coordinates. Um, maybe I'll just say remembering polar coordinates. This is one of those things where uh, coming to class is kind of useful because this is not necessarily the way Torian approaches it in her videos and it's not really the way it's approached on the worksheets, but I think that this is worth doing a little bit of extra effort up front to understand these like this this back and forth process between x, y coordinates and polar coordinates, r theta, because somehow uh, you can just do all of this trigonometry, most of the stuff in, in um, chapter four with this like one single idea. So it's kind of a hard idea to, to think about and internalize just how do we do these polar coordinates. Um, but I think it's uh, it's definitely worth the effort up front because it makes the last five to six units um, that much easier. Just as a quick reminder of how this goes, we kind of choose our little reference frame. So we've sat down, we've decided that someplace in the real world is the origin, so we've marked that. We've picked two orthogonal directions, y hat, x hat. And let's say we pick a pair, r and theta. The first thing I do is I measure theta, so maybe it gives me something like this. That's the angle theta. Remember that theta determines a ray. This is an important idea. Um, but if we choose an R, then we choose a point on that ray. So now we get a line segment of radius R. And so let me see if I can switch to a different eraser. Yes, okay, cool. So once we've done that, we can get a line segment or another way to think about this is as a, so maybe I'll make this polar coordinates slash, uh, slash vectors. I'm sorry, I just saw that something was in chat, so let me just double check. Four point five p. Oh, cool. from the pre class. Okay, so. We are, sorry, let me just switch the, switch the eraser back here. Okay. So we are thinking about um, r theta determining a vector in the plane. So it's an arrow with a direction and a magnitude. So the direction is theta, the magnitude is r. And we get some coordinate out of it, x, y. And the formula for that coordinate is given by the following. The x coordinate is r cosine of theta, and the y coordinate is r sine of theta. And I guess I should mention here, there is a way to kind of go back from this. So if you, this is kind of like going from, so this is like going from r theta to x, y values. And there's a way to go backwards, which we didn't talk about. I'll just tell you what the formula is. If you're given x and y, And there's a formula for r. Namely, r is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. And hopefully, well, I'll go back up to the triangle in a second. 
I'll just tell you what the theta is. Um, and the theta is a little complicated. This is the best way to put it. Instead, what I can say, sort of what has an easy description is telling you what the reference angle theta is. And this is the arc tangent or inverse tangent of y over x. Okay, so hopefully, let me try to point out why it's hopefully believable that the r thing would work. Um, so right, if we, if we had this coordinate x, y, we could drop a perpendicular down to the axis. So that would be a right angle. The length of this segment would be x. The length of this segment would be y. And we would just be doing the Pythagorean theorem to get r. So this is just r squared equals x squared plus y squared. So no real funny business there, um, except that we've kind of gone through this process of breaking a vector into components kind of without explicitly saying so. But we've broken it into a horizontal component and a vertical co component, and the length of the horizontal component was x, and the length of the vertical component was y. And so, okay, we do Pythagorean theorem to get r, no big deal. To get theta, well, we can just note that if we pick this um, theta here, we have an adjacent, opposite, and a hypotenuse in this triangle that we found. And tangent of theta right, would be equal to the opposite over the adjacent side. And for us, that's y over x. These are just lengths. And so if I apply So I'll maybe apply arctan to both sides. And the key thing to remember here is that just like exp uh, the exponential and the log, an arc trig function in the original one, so arc sine and sine, arc cosine and cosine, and so on, these are um, a functional, a pair of functional inverses. Right? So we're not really like, we're not multiplying them. We're actually taking tangent of theta and plugging it into arc, arctan as a function. And the whole thing about functional inverses is that they, when you compose them together like this, it's like you did nothing at all. So it's the identity function. It just gives you the argument back. So the argument, full argument there is just theta. And so this would tell you that theta is arctangent of y over x. So this is kind of a, an aside here, kind of motivating this stuff. Um, but well, the, the problem is, is that this only really works in the first quadrant just because of the way we've drawn our picture. So here's kind of a warning here is that I'll put it up here. Is to always draw a picture. So this goes for virtually everything in this unit. Try to find some way to draw a picture, because this is sort of a sanity check. Um, you know that the algebra we're doing um, at least makes sense, say in like the first quadrant or something. Um, but the problem is, is that we can't actually use this picture for a proof. Um, it's just one of the tools in our tool bag. And what goes wrong is that if I'm in quadrant two or three, I think are the problem areas, um, this arc tangent is going to come back with an incorrect sign. So if you just plug this into your calculator, you're not going to quite get the right thing. So we, we aren't going to have to worry about this too much because we're never going to do this direction of it. We're not going to start with an xy and go to an r theta. It'll usually be the other way around. Um, but kind of the thing to keep in mind here is that if you ever do need this, it comes up in engineering and physics. Um, 
then you just have to be a little bit careful because Arctangent is just giving you the reference angle. And so you need to actually play this flipping game um, to figure out, you know, you have to like sit down and draw a picture to figure out what quadrant to put it in. And maybe you have to, um, what happens here is that theta is equal to theta ref for the reference angle, but you might have to adjust it by pi. So what'll happen is that whatever you get out of Arctan will either be pointing in the correct direction, in which case you're fine, or it'll be pointing in exactly the opposite direction of what you want. So it determines the same sort of line segment, the same ray, it's just pointing in the wrong direction. I shouldn't say, so it's not the same ray, but it's, it's determining the same line. So you just need to flip the X and Y coordinates a little bit. Um, but I guess this is useful, like if you ever end up doing like computer science or something too, you have to do this all the time because your computer monitor is a two dimensional plane. And uh, you know, sometimes you have to do this kind of transformation to like draw something on a monitor. Um, okay, so there's a little bit of how to go back and forth between those two representations. Just keep in mind, we won't need this one much. Another important concept was vectors and breaking into components. Just because we're pressed on time, we have to say a lot about the project. Um, I won't say much more about this, but um, you want to look through a little bit the, um, the notes from last time where we had one vector and we broke it into an X component and a Y component. And uh, you'll need that for the project. So try to make sure you understand that, or if not, bring it to the, um, uh, to the office hours. Oh, and I see somebody's asking in chat if this was the method we were supposed to use for question 12, or sorry, quiz 12 on the first question. And the answer there is not quite, um, sort of. I mean, you can use this process to do it. Um, what you kind of wanted to do in, in that question was to essentially, if you just draw a picture like what's happening here, then you can just reason about these side lengths. And if you, um, I think what happens there is if you plug in these side lengths, you get something that's like a standard angle. So maybe you do the inverse tangent of one or something like that. And then you know that um, just from like this geometric ratio business that that's like a sine over a cosine. So you need some angle where the sine is equal to the cosine if the tangent is going to be equal to, to one. Um, so this is maybe just like, what I'm saying here is like an easier sort of general way to go about this, but you can always kind of go to this kind of picture and draw the triangle and reason about the, um, the actual ratios. Um, okay. So we have this business about breaking a vector into components. And I'll just do a quick sketch of what this is supposed to look like. Something like this, something like this. We had some vector. Very important, we've chosen a coordinate system, so we should tell the reader the details of the system. Um, the idea here was that we could break this into horizontal piece by kind of projecting it down. And we could break it into a vertical piece by projecting it onto the y-axis. But we will remember that we can kind of move vectors around freely as long as we keep their lengths. And so if we had some, let's just say this is a vector, D with a little arrow is just telling you that it's a vector. Then there, the red one is a V sub X and the blue one was a V sub Y. And there were kind of formulas to determine what the, like how do you actually express these vectors? Like if you knew that this vector was given by a point X, Y, then you could find coordinates for these and it essentially boils down to using polar coordinates. To get the VX and the VY. Okay, so that being said, I think we're hopefully ready to, 
talk about something slightly new. Let me see if I can pull this up. It works. Okay, so hopefully this animation is visible to everyone. Just one sec here. So this is kind of a new situation we want to think about. Not really so new, but there'll be something new that comes out of it. And so we want to think about sort of what's happening here is, let me see if I can simplify this a little bit. So we have this kind of situation to start out with. Um, and it's just like a little particle traveling around in a circle. Um, over time right now, it's just on the unit circle. And so what I'm doing here is these are literally just, I'm plotting cosine of theta and sine of theta as theta ranges between zero and two pi. So this is giving you a little point on the circle. And as theta increases from 0 to 2 pi, it's traveling in a counterclockwise um, fashion around the circle. And this is kind of the, the basic model of um, periodic behavior. And so we want to uh, use this to model um, other things that are periodic in the world. Um, so there's sort of two things that will be important here. One of them is that we will measure I don't know if I can here. Okay, so we need this one and that one. Okay. So there are two things that we could measure on this particle. One of them is that we've chosen our origin and we can measure the height of this thing. So this is just the y coordinate as we go around. And you can kind of see that if you're just thinking about the height, it's starting out at zero, it's increasing to one, and then it's decreasing back to zero. And then it kind of continues decreasing once you're all the way over on the left-hand side. So let me, let me do it like this. So we start here at zero. As we travel from, we're just increasing theta from zero to pi halves. The y coordinate is just getting bigger and bigger until we max out at one. And at, at which point it starts decreasing again. Okay, so this is going from pi halves to pi. At some point we hit zero again. After we increase past pi, then now we have a y coordinate decreasing and eventually it mins out and then it increases again. So that's one thing that we could measure is just the height of this particle over time. And then another thing we could measure here, if I turn these two off, these two on. Uh, maybe that's not the greatest way to see it. Um, but we could measure the so hopefully you can see the, the kind of blue thing swinging back and forth um, from left to right. We could measure the, the x coordinate as we go around. And we remember that the x coordinate literally was cosine of theta. And so what we're trying to do is understand cosine is like a function of time instead of a function of theta. So change the, the domain a little bit. Um, and so you can just see it that as the x coordinate, or sorry, as we as we go around the circle, the x coordinate is just changing in sort of a similar way. It is starting out at one. And as you go over time, just following the blue dot on the, the projection down to the x axis, it is decreasing, it eventually hits zero continues decreasing and hits negative one. And at some point it starts increasing again and goes back to one at the end of the day and then starts over. So these are kind of two phenomena we'd, we'd like to understand. Just as we vary this coordinate around the circle, we wanna measure the X uh, coordinate and the Y coordinate separately. Okay, so let's start off by looking at what the sine function looks like when you do this. Okay, so hopefully this is, hopefully everybody can see the, the animation here. 
what we're doing again, this is just the sine function on the unit circle. And now we're thinking of it as a, a function of time instead of theta. So if you think about the y coordinate as a function of time, all I'm really doing is just measuring the height as I let this particle sort of run around the circle over time. And I'm just measuring the height at every, every point in time. And what I'm getting out is some kind of graph in the xy plane that looks like this sort of thing, where you can tell there's there's some kind of periodicity to it, right? Because as soon as I've done two pi revolutions, right, I'm just now back to, to square zero, right? I can just start, um, you know, I've kind of measured all the possible ways the height could change in that full revolution. So this is the kind of animation to keep in mind. We're just measuring the y coordinate. Um, now let's think about what happens when you measure the x coordinate. This one's a little bit trickier to keep track of. All right, so let me maybe walk through this one a little bit slower here. So if we're starting off here at zero, at time zero, we're just measuring a height of one as we increase from zero to pi halves in terms of theta. And just at each time, we're just recording the height of the y-coordinate. You can see that the graph here is just measuring that height and it's maxing out. So we're seeing the exact same behavior. As we continue past pi halves to pi, we're getting a decreasing of the y coordinate, decreasing of the height until it zeroes out, continues, it mins out at some point. At two pi, comes back to zero, and then we're just playing the same game again. It's periodic. So it's periodic with zero to two pi in this case. And we just measure the heights again. So if we're doing the same thing now with um, the x coordinates instead of the y coordinates, what you end up with is something, right? So if we're starting at time zero, you just maybe let this run a few times first. So theta is increasing. And then over time, we're just asking at each point in time, so let me just run this forward. At each point in time, what is the x coordinate of that uh, particle on the unit circle? Well, the x coordinate it literally is just cosine of theta. How is that varying over time? It's starting at one. We are here, so it's a cosine starting at one there. As we go up to pi halves, we're decreasing to zero, right? Because you're just pointing straight up. There's no x coordinate. X x is zero. As you go, continue on to pi, the x coordinate goes all the way out to negative one on the unit circle. So we're minning out in terms of this cosine graph. Right again, the cosine graph is really just measuring the x coordinate. And then as you um, go past pi radians into the third quadrant, the x coordinate starts decreasing again down to zero until eventually it's increasing again, and then it's two pi for periodic. On the project, are we um, only looking at zero to pi or something because of like the sun, like it rises okay. Yep, exactly. And it sets or something like but, that. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated because, yeah, you'll be looking at, yeah, angles between zero and pi. And what you'll want to do is come up with um, what it'll be is the angle theta as a function of t. So it's, it's going to be a little bit weird. So you won't necessarily get a cosine graph like this out. Um, Yeah, maybe it's easier just to say what that'll actually be. Yeah, so essentially what'll happen is that when you do this kind of thing, yeah, you'll just be starting at zero and going to pi in terms of angles. But what'll happen is that for the this like function you're coming up with, the angles will be the range of your function. And instead what you'll wanna do is have a t going from zero to 24 and it'll go, and your thing will go from like zero to pi, and then it'll stay zeroed out for a while for the rest of the day. And then back at the start of the next day, you'll start back at angle zero. So yeah, it's it's, it's essentially the right idea, except for the the angles are the, the outputs instead of the inputs um, than what you're doing in the project. 
Hopefully that fixed things. I think my microphone went out for a sec. Okay. So these are the, the sort of things to keep in mind for these um, trig functions that you really want to think of sort of a particle moving around the circle. Cosine is measuring the x-coordinate over time. And sine is measuring the y-coordinate over time. And that's kind of where these these usual, these other graphs you've probably seen elsewhere have come up. I guess I'll say a quick word about sort of the, the general form for these things. So the general form, so what I'll just say is of a wave. Um, so there's an ident identity, like somehow I think it just suffices to think about cosine. Um, it's kind of the easiest way to, to approach it is that every wave is just a cosine and a sine is just like a, si a shifted cosine, if you think about that, um, using the one of the trig identities or something. So if you understand cosine really well, then it's not too difficult to transfer all of your knowledge to a sine function. The way this works is that if you have so a sign, so uh, well, start with the picture, how this will work. So it's a little bit tricky because we're graphing things now where the dependent variable isn't really an X, but it's a, um, uh, like a time or something, because we're thinking about this particle moving around as a function of time. And the outputs will be I don't know, you can call them really anything. Maybe I'll just call them Ws or something. And if we're thinking about like some kind of wave, the general form will be f of t equals a cosine. I guess W wasn't great here. Let's call this L or something. So the general form is a cosine omega t minus phi. And what does this correspond to? Uh, essentially, uh, sorry, let me extend this down a little bit so we have some room. So there's a plus a, a minus a. So if you have a cosine, I guess this is starting at one in general. Uh, starting at one for like the parent function cosine. Here, this would be starting at a, where you've shifted over by some phase shift phi. And I'll just roughly sketch what this does. And so something like this, where the there's a, a period here of, this ends up being two pi over omega. This thing's called the period. This phi was the phase shift. And so we're just looking at one period, but this is a periodic function, which just means that um, if we just know this one little region, we kind of know it everywhere because it just repeats itself. After that, it continues in essentially the same way. And I think that's pretty much it for this. Um, so there are just three important parameters. One of them is this A amplitude. It's very important to, um, to recognize that your amplitude is not just the height of the graph or anything like that. It's You have to take the, the midpoint of the heights. So it's like the average height or something like that. But so. Yeah, so it should be going plus a units above the the sort of you know, let me just draw this line in here. So it's 
So I don't know, one, one analogy here is that electricity, for example, is modeled by waves and the red line would be like a, like a ground current or something like that. But the ground current doesn't necessarily have to be zero. Um, it could be like, you know, you could have like a, something shifted up by 12 or something, just some baseline. And then you oscillate around the baseline and the, the A is just measuring how far are you away from the baseline at any given time. Um, so this will, we don't have to worry about this for the moment, this like amplitude business, but you'll see this on later pre-classes, um, some, some sort of common mistakes there. Okay, and you may need this to, um, as you're doing the, the modeling of your function for the project, something like this may be useful, um, but you may want something like a sign instead, depending on how you set it up. Um, but the sign really just works the same way except for you might have to change, this would not start at, um, you know, one there, instead it would start at zero. <clears throat> okay, so let's say some stuff about the project. Um, so number one has to see Here's an uploaded video from Kel who designs the project. You know, he sort of um, does this for all of the, the pre-calculus classes. Um, and so he's, he's put up a video where he kind of walks through the example calculation in the project handout. And I think that's that's worth going through. Um, you'll see a lot of the same stuff I'm saying today showing up there. Um, but if you need a reminder of kind of what's happening, it's probably one of the best resources uh, let's just kind of remember what was going on. So let me grab a screenshot here. This will save us some time writing. Okay, hopefully that's visible. If you remember, we had this kind of situation. The idea is we want to, or sort of the goal for this is to, uh, we, have, we have some kind of leaf sitting on the earth. It's absorbing some sunlight over the day. And we want to know how much um, sunlight could it theoretically possibly um, absorb throughout the entire day. And so eventually this will, you know, if we were going for like the theoretical maximum, there's kind of a, a, a phenomenon here where only these light rays that are hitting the leaf in a perpendicular manner um, contribute to the energy that it absorbs. So we have to do some business about fiddling with how do we break up this light ray into components and find a component that's um, hitting this in a perpendicular way. And so what we'll do first is analyze this in a stationary way. So the leaf is in the same place, but the sun is moving over it. And so that'll give us some amount of energy that we could expect. But then you could also imagine, um, you know, if leaves were, if leaves were trying to, you know, or trees were trying to optimize the amount of energy they absorb in a, a given day, you know, they might like shift their leaves a little bit so that they're always perpendicular to the sun to max maximize that energy. Um, so that's kind of the behavior we want to understand for this is like, if the tree was doing everything in its power to keep itself aligned with the, the light rays at all time, what is the total possible energy it could absorb over a 24 hour period? Okay. And yeah, maybe this will help answer the uh, question from earlier, if I just drop this picture in. So we have something like this. This is kind of our simplified model of what's happening, uh, which didn't preserve the ratio, unfortunately. Uh, do that. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the model was is that this yellow line was like an incoming uh, light vector. And what will happen is that this light vector will um, also is like an energy density or something coming coming from the sun. So there's kind of two phenomena to keep in mind here. One of them is that this yellow vector depends on time. So time zero, it's, you know, sitting out horizontally. As time increases, it's, you know, kind of sweeping out the horizon and ranging from zero to high. And then 
you know, once the day starts again, it kind of resets and goes, goes back to uh, zero. And so there are two angles to think about here. One of them was this angle that the light ray was making with this plane of the leaf. And that's, the, that's something that's changing over time. And the other one, the one that's important for us, is what angle is this light ray making with the, we've kind of made this green kind of vector in pointing out of the leaf, sort of indicating what the orthogonal direction is. And the component of the yellow vector that's lining up with the green vector, once we do this decomposition, will be the component that's being absorbed. And so you can see that that's, you know, here in this first situation, it's not maximized because some component is kind of lost in the the horizontal direction. The cell breaks up into something that goes that way a little bit, something that goes that way. So if it's a fixed amount of energy, some of it's getting lost because those rays are more parallel. In this situation in the middle, all like all the right light rays, it's exactly lining up. So the, the um, sort of the agreement of these angles is maximized, the amount of the energy density there. And then we kind of go back to a mid again. Okay, and what's happening here is that we want to think of L as a function of time. L of t. This is a little bit weird to think about, but this is something, um, if you give me a time value, I tell you what the vector is. So I'm telling you what the full yellow arrow is. Um, but kind of that's, that's a little bit hard to think about. So to simplify things, uh, maybe I'll just write theta sub L as a function of time, theta sub ln as a function of time. I haven't labeled these super well, but let's call this angle theta sub ln. So just the angle between whatever orthogonal you have on the leaf and the light ray coming in. I'm just remembering that this changes over time because the sun is moving. And then theta l, which is this angle here. So you get two um, angles that depend on time. And maybe it's actually, maybe it's helpful to kind of think about what these look like in terms of graphs. So again, we have to be a little bit careful with domains and codomains. What we're sending into these functions will be t values and what we're getting out will be theta values. So what happens here is that there's going to be some, let's say we're doing theta L of t. And the first thing I would say to do is like, let's determine the domain of theta L of t. And this is just asking like, what are the t values we should be expecting? And these will be from zero to uh, maybe 24. You just include one of the endpoints to make sure you get the full day. What is the range of theta? sub L of t. And this is, if we go back up to this picture, this is exactly the, so the, all the possible values this angle could take. And so we'll kind of artificially restrict this to say zero to pi. And I'll just mention there is a way to make this work where you don't have to make this restriction to where like it would more naturally model the fact that, you know, that at some point the sun is kind of, or I don't know, the earth is turned away from the sun or something like that. So this angle, if you think about this light angle coming in, sorry, let's go to the last picture here. At some point the angle is pi. And if you think about just what would happen if you continued rotating, well, at some point this would be coming in like that and you would get some kind of like negative angle or some obtuse angle between um, the light vector and the, or the perpendicular vector. And you could kind of make that work with equations, but 
um, for us since we have a choice over the function. It's maybe easier just to say it's zero um, or to say it stops at, at pi or something like that. So you could have this be zero to two pi. It would just be more, more complicated um, to work out. And so what this, this graph will look like is if we just go back up to this picture, we know it's something that should start at zero. Maybe I'll mark off where 12 noon is, and then I'll mark off where 24 hours will be. And so what I want is that as in this picture, I want when the, let's see, so we're looking at theta sub L of t. So this should be something that increases from zero to uh, pi will be the max. And so we know we have two points on this graph, something at zero, zero, and something here at 24 hours in pi. And okay, I'll just draw one possible function that might make sense here, which is be a linear function. So this is an angle that increases over time and it just increases at a constant rate. So this is just a linear um, kind of growth. And let me just indicate really quickly, we've only specified one period, but we want this to exist for all time. So what you can do is just say, okay, this function is going to be periodic. So it's just going to repeat itself there and it's going to repeat itself there. And you can kind of work with it this way. Um, but you can see this is a little bit of a problem, right? Because we can't have, for it to be a function, we can have two outputs for one input. And so time zero is going to be a little bit of an issue. Time 24, time 48, and so on. So you kind of need to delete a point somewhere. So maybe you delete this point. So you're saying that theta of 24 is equal to zero. It's also equal to theta, sorry, this is theta L of zero. So you just have to be a little bit careful, maybe delete some points to make sure you get a function. Um, then you just make it periodic everywhere. But actually you get to choose what this function should be. So maybe you, you might think that there's, you know, is it, is it true that the sun just sort of gradually increases angle at a constant rate? Maybe that's true. Um, you might think that, you know, maybe it's something more like this where sun increases. I don't know, I'll just draw another function in here randomly. You might think it's more gradual like this green thing. Um, I don't know, you could have something kind of more like that. It increases really quickly in the early part of the day and then kind of levels off. The angle doesn't change as quickly later in the day. So you have a lot of choice over what function to use for, for this. Um, but in any case, you'll have at least two points to model your function on. Um, and so you can you know go into Desmos and do a fit if you want, kind of mess around, see what kind of functions um, you might like there. So you can, you know, do things like theta of t equals um, a naught t squared, where a naught is like a parameter plus a one t plus, and uh, maybe make these match up, a two t plus a one t, a two t squared plus a one t plus a zero. So you might fit it to like a some kind of parabola or something in this this range, or maybe shift it around a little, little bit. Um, you might do theta. And these are all theta l's of t. Maybe you want to do uh, a one of t plus a naught, which would be this like linear function situation. Maybe you think it's uh, an exponential change. You have to pick some kind of function, and then in your um, in which you're writing up, you should sort of justify your choice with some like, what physical intuition are you using from uh, this situation to decide on what function to use? Okay, um, so this is, we've looked at theta L of T. So 
let's look at theta L n of C. And just remembering what these are in the physical situation, theta L is just the angle of the sun where we haven't even um, talked about the leaf yet. Theta L n is the component, or sort of the angle between the light ray and this normal vector for the leaf. So we'll need to model this as a function of time too. Okay, and again, we have to be a little bit careful with domains and ranges. The domains are again time values, the outputs are angles theta. And now we have to kind of fit this to our intuition from the picture, or at least start there to figure out what kind of function to use. So we're, we're examining the this kind of angle here between the green and the yellow vector. And if we like plot this on Desmos and just sort of thought of this like particle running around the circle sort of thing, we see that the angle starts off being big. So it starts off being uh, a right angle. As L sort of you know traces out the sky, this angle closes up to zero. And as L continues past like 12 noon, uh, this angle is opening back up to uh, something like pi halves. So maybe you get something like there's pi halves. Here we're at time zero. Think about what happens at 12, what happens at 24. So it seems like we're at zero. I'm sorry, we're at pi halves at time zero. We're at pi halves at time. 24. Uh, let me just double check something here. Uh, yeah, should be fine. So the angle between these two start, you know, something like And this, maybe you think it's just kind of linearly increases if you chose the linear function for this one. Uh, you might think it's something more like you know, this, if it sort of changes, the rate of change changes over time. Maybe it's something more like a, a parabola or something. Uh, you might think it kind of changes more gradually To something like that. So all of this is so you have to choose. Uh, sort of what function uh, to use here. And okay, once you have all of this done, you are essentially ready to go for the last, well, sort of the last part of the analysis for the stationary leaf. So what will happen here is that you've come up with these functions, theta ln of t, theta l of t, and these could be related in some way. Like you can maybe just do theta l of t and then do something to it to get theta ln of t. Um, uh, if you use some geometric considerations from, from this picture here, you might expect that these angles are related somehow. So maybe their functions over time are related to. Um, but whatever you end up doing, um, what will happen is that we found out, let's see if I can find what we concluded from last time. Okay, so I can paste this in. Okay, so this is, I'm sorry, it's super blurry, but uh, it's a little bit about what we talked about um, last time. We were talking about, so F and G we were talking about here. These are corresponding to our theta, maybe theta L of T, theta L N of T we're talking about today. 
The point is they can just be any functions. We concluded somehow that so this, there was this energy density um, that depended on the vector, this light ray vector L. We found that it was proportional to the sine of theta one. And we kind of did some, some derivation to get there. So you'll want to try to reproduce this sort of derivation when you're writing up your analysis. So you'll need some way of drawing geometric pictures and kind of arguing about, um, you know, why is this why is this sign showing up? That should really be something you explain in the project. Um, but once you have this, now I guess I should say something a little bit more about what happened here. Um, we found that E of L was proportional to sine of theta, and then we came up with this function that just gave us the vertical component. So I'm saying call that function g of t, and we made an assumption. This was assuming at some point we assumed um, that the vector had radius one, and this kind of made the analysis a lot simpler for us. And the reason we did that is because we can actually go through, and at the end of the day, scale up that vector by whatever we want, and we can scale it up by a function. So this function e of t is going to be something else you figure out from, so you'll find an energy density function. Sorry, I realize we just have one minute left here. So I would look at the video for some more details on how this part will go, and we'll talk about it more a little bit later. But the idea here is that the energy density hitting it. Um, so this is energy density, say, E on this axis as a function of time. It will max out at like 136 or something. And you want some kind of function that does this kind of thing, probably more symmetric. And this will depend on time and should just, yeah, so you actually get to, to choose this too. Um, so you have to kind of argue about, so the energy density kind of depends on this angle. So your whatever sort of functions you chose up here for your angles, your angle functions, right? So theta ln was measuring the angle between the light vector and the, the plant. So this should be somehow related to the energy density, right? Because if you're off at an angle, you get much less energy coming in than if you're at a, you know, an angle that's lined up. So these two analyses should be tied pretty closely together. And what'll happen at the end is that total energy let's say in a time period delta t will be equal to essentially e of t times g of t times the area of the leaf times a little delta t this is getting into a kind of a more complicated part of the analysis, so I'll say more about that. Um, but kind of what you want to have, you know, started on is definitely finding these angle functions, and then starting to choose this energy uh, density function. Okay, so that video is up in um, ELC right now under projects. So definitely try to look that over, and then I'll be in office hours, in department office hours, uh, four to five. Um, yep, that'll let you go. I'll post these notes up online. So to find like the light intensity, you do just like, could you use your time on your, as your like kind of your X and then your angle? Cause the angles change constantly, right? On the first part. Mm -hmm. And that, could you like find the like vector or the, I don't know, it would be like the hypotenuse, I guess. 
Would that be your light intensity? Essentially, when you go back to to this picture here, the uh, the yellow vector coming in. In the first part, we kind of assumed it was length one, so we could find out what the component was. And then this e of t function you're doing is um, making this vector longer or shorter based on time. Okay. Uh, that, it's, it's a little bit complicated. I'll try to, I have a demo for next time that'll hopefully make it a little bit more clear. Also my partner, like for the, we met on Zoom and he found the leaf and stuff and he was gonna use, like the project says to you divide it into rectangles or something and then, mm -hmm. but he was gonna just do it like some sort of calculus way. I don't know, like some sort of other way to find the area that's more accurate. Like, oh, I see. and I was gonna like ask, cause I was like, maybe we should ask if that's like, I don't know if, Maybe like they want us to use the rectangles. I don't know. I think it's probably, yeah, I think that's that's the intended way for this project. If you look at the video, part of this, um, part of what Kel has, has lined up for people is to put this info in a spreadsheet. Yeah, so what, what this is, is this is doing an approximation of something from calculus where we're measuring like little rectangles instead of doing something called the integral, which does that precisely. Yeah, I remember like the Raymond sums or something like that from when I took calculus in high school, but I don't remember. Uh, yeah, like I don't remember much of it, but I remember the Raymond sums. Yeah, so this is exactly that same thing. And then the at the end of the day, what you're going to do is chunk up the day into like little two hour blocks and then just evaluate this function at every two hours and that'll approximate it. And if you imagine if you chunked it up into one hour blocks or like 30 minute blocks or 15 minutes, the approximation would get better and better and better. But we're just doing kind of a very rough approximation. Okay, thank you. No problem.